Robert Jan van Pelt has taught at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture since 1987. And he is an international and he's internationally recognized for his work in architectural history and the study of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Most notably, he also served as an expert witness for the defense in the notorious libel case David Irving versus Penguin Books and Deborah Lipstadt, which took place at the end of the 90s. And I'm not sure if you guys uh, remember, but there was a movie in 2016 called Denial, and I just watched the movie and I highly recommend it. Uh, Professor of, uh, Van Pelt is currently a member of the architectural board for Babin Yar, the ravine in Kiev, Ukraine. That was the site of one of the largest single massacres in the Holocaust. He has been helping to plan what will be the world's largest Holocaust Memorial Center, which is to include a synagogue, a church, a mosque, and a research center and two museums to commemorate both the atrocities of what happened at Babi Yar and the wider genocide against Eastern European Jews. Now, um, his latest book, which will be out shortly, chronicles those plans and is titled, How Beautiful Are Your Dwelling Places, Jacob? It's an atlas of Jewish space and a synagogue for Babi Yar. I'd now like to hand over, uh, I'd now like to hand it over to Professor Van Pelt to discuss this new project. So welcome. Um, thank you very much, Gail. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm speaking here from Berlin. Actually, uh, I'm located right next to the Nordbahnhof, which gives me a 40 minute access to the Sachsenhausen uh, concentration camp if I were to want to go there right now. And in fact, tonight I'm having dinner with the director of the Sachsenhausen Memorial, uh, but it will happen outside because uh, you really don't want to go inside anymore because of the rapidly worsening um, COVID situation. So we'll be sitting in really heavy coats. <laughs> I hope some have some, some hot wine with it. Um, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to uh, uh, basically share my screen and uh, giving you a presentation um, about um, about this. Uh, yeah, it's a, in some ways, it's a mixed presentation. It is partly about Babi Yar, uh, and so you see here. Uh, if everything is okay, you see a screen it's with uh, the name. Are you fine? Okay. Uh, you see the screen with uh, the logo of Babi Yar, which is basically a, uh, in some ways, is inspired by the, the by the map of the ravine itself, uh, the ravine where in 1941 the uh, the massacre took place. Uh, I will also talk about uh, a little bit about my role in the um, in this in this project to develop uh, this uh, whatever remains of the ravine as, as a memory place. Uh, and about the book that uh, I wrote together with Mark Potwell, a um, uh, US-based artist from New York, uh, which is uh, called An Atlas of Jewish Space, which is part of a somewhat larger project called How Beautiful Are Your Dwellings, Jacob, which um, in some way frames uh, the project that we've created the past year at Babi Yar, which is uh, the construction of a synagogue at the site. So here we have the book as it was uh, the, the version that was developed for the uh, 80th, com 80th uh, year commemoration of the massacre itself that uh, basically happened at the beginning of October this year. Um, and when I had the privilege to be in, in Babi Yar and to be witness to an absolutely amazing commemoration uh, also uh, that included the, uh, the, the famous Babi Yar symphony by Shostakovich the second time that it was performed in the former Soviet Union. Any case, this is a box. You see the box itself, how beautiful are your dwelling places, Jacob. And then on one side, uh, you see uh, an atlas of two space uh, with my name and Mark Potwell's name. And then when you turn around the box, you see on the other side of the box, a synagogue for Babi Yar by Manuel Hertz, Galina Andrushensko and Ivan Bahn. And so basically this book contains two books, uh, to the left, the synagogue from Barbie Yard, to the right, an atlas of Jewish space. Uh, this is then uh, a, a spread from my, my book with, uh, with, uh, with Mark Potwell, and you see two of his images there. It's always two pages with my text and two pages, uh, and then followed by a spread with Mark Potwell's images. 
135 images and 135 very short texts of around uh, 350 words each. But uh, when the, uh, the, the, the magic in this box is actually uh, when you open it and then uh, unfolds the synagogue. And in fact, the, the box is actually a model of the synagogue itself because the synagogue also unfolds like a book. So this is the synagogue uh, as it was photographed uh, uh, at the beginning of September, uh, opened. Uh, sitting uh, on the uh, very lightly touching the ground at the Babi Yar site. Uh, it's not exactly at the place where uh, the murders took place, and I will go into that uh, a little later, uh, but it is right next to it, uh, an open synagogue, and, and in, 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 in that it is actually quite remarkable uh, in that it uh, allows many non-Jewish people for the first time to actually enter a synagogue without feeling the kind of hesitancy they would have if they would go to an existing synagogue where there are many thresholds for them to negotiate. Um, here we have uh, to the left the architect, um, uh, uh, Manuel Hertz, uh, an architect from Basel who uh, became quite well known around 10 years ago for the, um, for the construction of the synagogue in Mainz, which was uh, in Germany, which was considered to be uh, one of the best post-war synagogues created on the continent of Europe, with his wife Xenia and uh, their new uh, son Max, uh, who was born just at the time that uh, that uh, Manuel got uh, this commission. And they are in the uh, in the women's gallery, the very small symbolic women's gallery that uh, uh, unfolds from the wall when the synagogue is opened. Um, so. The synagogue uh, is a wooden synagogue that stands in the tradition of the wooden synagogues that, uh, that uh, existed in what's today Eastern Poland, Belarus, uh, Southern Lithuania and Ukraine uh, uh, in the 18th and 19th century and which were destroyed either during the uh, Russian Revolution and uh, the pogroms that followed it and uh, finally during the Holocaust. This tradition of the wooden synagogues of Eastern Europe uh, is, a, is a singular achievement uh, in the history of, of Jewish art. There is really, uh, one could say it is the only um, architectural tradition within Judaism uh, that, 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 was, that in some way is without really any parallels in the Christian tradition. And here we have an image of one of those synagogues in a drawing by Mark Potwell. Uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that in some way preserves the memory of, uh, of this particular one. Now, when we set out to, um, to conceive of the synagogue um, and, and we had identified Manuel as, uh, as our architect and, and everything went very quickly, the, all, all, all went within two weeks. Uh, uh, at the beginning of October, I suggested to the architectural board that we would, uh, that we would construct a synagogue and two weeks later, Manuel had the commission. Uh, Manuel came with the idea that, uh, of course, the Jewish people are the people of the book, and that the most important, um, the most important book, of course, is the Siddur, the prayer book, and that what we what we should do is create a synagogue that would, in some way, be a large Siddur, that it would uh, that we could open it and that we could close it. Uh, that when it's not in use, it is like a closed book, and that when we are using it, that uh, basically one uses 10 people to open the synagogue, uh, and then uh, it can be used for a service, and afterwards it can be closed again. So uh, the, the idea was not only um, uh, inspired by the idea of the Siddur, but also by the children's pop-up book. And, 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 and as, I, as I told you, um, in September of 2020, uh, Xenia and Manuel got their son, Max. And so uh, uh, Manuel was very much thinking about these kind of children books and the magic of these children books. And so, uh, so he came to this proposal that it would not simply be a book, but it would be like a synagogue pop-up book. And so here we have the basic, uh, the, 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 the first kind of set of drawings, the concept that he submitted to our committee. Uh, you see in the top left, you see the synagogue when it's closed, when it's not in use. 
and then uh, it can be opened. The, 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 the walls can be uh, basically moved away from each other. As that happens, a ceiling unfolds, and I will tell a little bit more about what's on the ceiling. And then uh, once the ceiling is up, then uh, you have uh, from the left uh, the, the women's gallery that, that comes out of the, of the one book cover, and then the, uh, the uh, bima uh, with seats uh, basically comes out of the other wall, and one has a complete synagogue, even if it is uh, right, rather small. So here in the plan, uh, the synagogue, when it's closed, uh, and uh, you see uh, at the bottom, you see basically the niche with the uh, with the uh, the ark, and 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 the uh, the bima uh, in some way it fits around it when it's closed, and you see the staircase towards the women gallery, which is also uh, basically uh, now contained within the wall, but when the synagogue is opened then uh, the bima has been folded out. You see the, 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 the table from which the ark can be read. And you see also now that the women's gallery has been unfolded. Um, uh, very much, of course, uh, symbolic everything. I mean, it's not really functional as a women's gallery, but certainly it's very functional as a synagogue. And uh, it was a great honor for us as the chief rabbi of, of Ukraine uh, it, during uh, the last year's Yom Kippur decided to uh, basically observe Yom Kippur in this synagogue. So here we have uh, basically the, the drawing that shows some of the, the elements uh, of the synagogue. I will not go into detail, um, but um, what is very interesting is that in the tradition of the, uh, of the uh, East European synagogues, the most important prayers are painted on the walls. And what was particularly uh, interesting to, um, to, uh, for, for Manuel, and he came with us uh, with that proposal right early on, uh, uh, is the uh, number 11. It is the dream blessing in one of the uh, very famous Polish synagogues that was destroyed in 1941. On the wall was painted uh, uh, a, a prayer uh, to, um, to rid oneself of nightmares. And given the place where this synagogue was created at Babi Yar, it seemed to be very appropriate to include that prayer uh, uh, on the wall. Um, very special is the ceiling. Here we have the original uh, design for the ceiling. And uh, the ceiling actually shows a constellation uh, in the language of the ceilings of the uh, 18th century painted synagogues from Eastern Europe. But the particular constellation that it shows is the constellation of um, September 29, 1941. That is the day or the night of the massacre of 34,000 Jews at Babi Yar. So when the synagogue is, is open in some way, the sky of that terrible night is uh, revealed. Um, so let's go now to, uh, to that, that date, 29th and 30th of, uh, of, of September, 1941, two days that actually uh, end with Yom Kippur. So the, the massacre uh, happened basically in the day before Yom Kippur. And here we have two German soldiers who are in the ravine of Babi Yar, uh, basically inspecting uh, clothing and, and personal items left behind. Um, uh, and uh, we don't have any uh, images of the actual murder at, uh, at Babi Yar, but we do have uh, photos of the aftermath. So here then a close-up photo of, uh, of some of the, uh, of the possessions left behind, which of course have to stand in for the people who are not there anymore. So um, the invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, the German invasion of the Soviet Union began on the 22nd of June, uh, 1941, uh, until that date, uh, Germany and the Soviet Union had had kind of an uneasy partnership that had started in late August 1939 when they agreed to basically divide Poland. And, um, but ultimately, uh, Hitler's anti Bolshevism uh, 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 basically proved stronger than 
his uh, the, the obvious need to keep Russia as a friend. And so the, uh, the German Wehrmacht invaded the Soviet Union uh, in June uh, 1941. And within a month, uh, uh, German troops, especially uh, so-called Einsatzgruppen, that were kind of police units and SS units that were traveling behind the advancing Wehrmacht, started to murder Jews. First, uh, only Jewish men. But by the beginning of August, uh, in the occupied uh, parts of uh, the Ukraine and Belarus, uh, they started also to include uh, Jewish women and children. And uh, with that, the genocide of the Jews really began. Until then, uh, also, there had been really no uh, kind of articulated plan uh, for the murder and the massacre of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of hundreds of thousands or even millions of Jews. But that changed very rapidly as the Germans uh, basically uh, moved into the Soviet Union and, and thought that this they had now an opportunity uh, to basically uh, realize their dream of a Jew-free Europe under the fog of war. So the, uh, uh, the city of Kiev, which is the capital of the, at that time, the Soviet Republic of Ukraine, uh, the city of Kiev was conquered uh, at, the, uh, at the end of September, in the second half of September. And uh, uh, initially, um, uh, the city seemed to surrender uh, without much trouble. But then there was a large uh, explosion in the city uh, created by Soviet partisans. And, 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 the, and the, the German rule immediately became very uh, violent. And part of this was also uh, the decision by the Germans to wipe out uh, the Jewish population of Kiev. And of course, Kiev is a traditional heartland of the Jewish people. It's the heart, the heart of the Pale of Settlement in the Soviet Union. Now, uh, many uh, uh, members of the Jewish community were not in Kiev anymore. Most of the men were uh, in, the, in the Red Army. And so basically the majority of, of, of people who were left behind were uh, old people, women, and children. And um, so here we have a German map of Kiev from 1942. So uh, it is located on the west bank of the Dnieper River. Uh, it's navigable. You can uh, basically, uh, ocean going vessels can go up to, uh, to Kiev. And um, you see more or less in the center of, of the picture, the old center of the city that goes back uh, more than a thousand years. It's also the beginning of Christianity in Eastern Europe. But when we're looking in the top, um, in the top uh, uh, left quadrant, uh, you see the area that is indicated by our pink kind of, uh, of, of, of circle. And this is a ravine that, uh, that, that had been always uh, at the edge of the city. This is the ravine of Babi Yar. And this was located right next to an old Jewish cemetery uh, here we have the ravine after the massacre when, uh, when captured Soviet POWs are basically um, cleaning up uh, uh, the, the mass grave, so to speak. And um, this, uh, this ravine became the place of the execution. Now, I will not say that much about it right now, except that 34,000 Jews were murdered in a 24 hour period. Uh, after that, the ravine became also a place where, at, uh, at some occasions, a number of Orthodox priests were executed. Uh, also, uh, uh, in 1943, uh, some Ukrainian, non-Jewish Ukrainian uh, resistance fighters uh, and Ukrainian nationalists were, uh, were murdered. And then after the war, the Soviet government decided really to ignore what had happened in the ravine. There was no memorial was there created. And the ravine, the Babi Yar ravine itself became a quarry for clay uh, that was going to be used to produce the bricks uh, that ultimately was going to uh, uh, extend the city uh, to create new housing for the city. So you see the buildings in the background. Uh, they are built with bricks that are actually harvested from the clay that is in the ravine of Babi Yar that you see right in front. 
Um, one of the uh, Soviet technologies to actually harvest the clay was to pump water into the ravine. There was a dam and you got a kind of a big mix of clay and water. It became a kind of a big mud, sea of mud. And uh, what happened in 1961, that the dam broke and this mudslide happened. And it, uh, first of all, destroyed the contours of the ravine completely because uh, in some way the ravine collapsed into this kind of bath of mud. And it also uh, uh, killed uh, around 1,500 people who lived downstream from the, uh, from the dam that had broken. And uh, this was another catastrophe that basically was unnamed and unmentioned at Babi Yar. So in 1961, the same year that the, uh, that the, uh, that the catastrophe happens with the mudslide, uh, Yevgeny Yevtushenko uh, publishes this poem uh, that describes the situation in Babi Yar. No monument stands over Babi Yar. A drop shear is a crude gravestone, I'm afraid. Today, I'm as old in years as all the Jewish people. Now I seem to be a Jew. Here I plot through ancient Egypt. Here I perish crucified on the cross. And to this day, I bear the scars of nails. Uh, the story of Babi Yar really, um, re in some way, uh, became known for the first time in the mid-1960s. Uh, as a result of a novel uh, 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 entitled Babi Yar that was translated in uh, many languages, inclusive English, and uh, it was originally forbidden in the Soviet Union and heavy, uh, heavy uh, censored. But it was this novel that in some way uh, brought the name into, uh, into kind of public discourse. And so here we have a detail of the, uh, the current uh, uh, site of Babi Yar. Um, and I'm again going to show where, uh, where the place is. And you see that today, um, Babi Yar is actually a public park that is now uh, in some way in the middle of the city. Not, it's a little bit at the periphery, but basically uh, uh, it, there are neighborhoods all around. It, so it's not anymore of the edge of the city as it was in 1941. And um, I'm just going to show you some pictures. Uh, it is an enormous site. It is around 120 hectares large. And so it includes a formal park, uh, which is closest to the major roads. And here we see uh, the, 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 the formal garden um, that is close to the metro station that is there. Um, then uh, there is also a large kind of uh, more wooded area. Uh, where you can easily get lost. <laughs> I've lost, been lost there. It's a place where families picnic and go out for, for, for Sunday afternoons and so on. Uh, there are some soccer fields there. There's a lot of mountain bike riding happening in this area. And then you have also ravines that in some way are leftovers of the uh, pieces that are leftovers of the original ravine. But as I told you before, that original ravine was re really collapsed in 1961. So uh, this is not exactly the contours as they existed in 1941. So uh, if we're looking at this map, we see here uh, the, the, the current, uh, the current um, basically urban plan. And you have in red that kind of buried reality of the historical ravine of, of 19, uh, 1941. It, it's not really visible anymore, but it is, you know, it can still be traced if you want to do it. And it's a lot of work. And we, we see then in these, that, that, that old ravine uh, basically is, you know, it's not really recognizable today in the site itself, but, uh, but, but it's still there in a sense as a ghost. And you see then all the um, red dots with numbers uh, which are uh, either monuments that have been created, or if we are looking at the um, top right of the plan, you see numbers 12, 14, and 15. Uh, this is actually the largest psychiatric hospital in uh, Europe. Uh, it's falling apart right now, but it's a very important psychiatric hospital still in the Ukraine. It's also the largest one in the Ukraine by implication. And it was actually uh, the, the massacre started uh, when the Germans started to murder 
the patients of this hospital, uh, which, which, which introduced in some way the murder of the Jews. So it is a, it's a very important site also in Babi Yar. So here, um, a list of uh, a selection of the memorials so uh, at Babi Yar. So there is a, uh, there is a lot of, 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 of kind of wild development has happened at Babi Yar in which uh, all kinds of people have basically introduced memorials, most of them uh, since uh, the independence of Ukraine in 1991. So there is one, the first one, it was created during the Soviet Union, it's memorial number one, uh, dedicated to Soviet citizens and POWs murdered at Babi Yar, it doesn't mention the word Jews. But then from the rest we have uh, we have a memorial to German prisoners of war. We have a memorial to executed priests. We have a, a memorial to Roma and Sinti. Uh, we have individual memorial. We have memorials to the victims of the Muslite, to uh, Russians who were sent to Germany as forced labor. So it's a kind of uh, free for all the site became. Here we have the 1970s memorial, um, uh, Soviet memorial that, uh, that uh, basically um, absorbs uh, the Holocaust into a narrative of Soviet heroism. It doesn't mention the word Jew, as I said. Also, doesn't really show uh, that women and children were the victims of the uh, of of the Babi Yar uh, massacre. And here, of course, these are all kind of strong men that you see. Uh, there is a menorah uh, at the site that was erected in the early 1990s. Uh, the first. Jews memorial, but uh, it, it is it is rather modest, as you see. Uh, then here we have a memorial uh, to uh, Roma and Sinti. This is a, a gypsy wagon. Um, and uh, then also we have a Orthodox church on the site. Uh, this is in, in, in memory of uh, the few Orthodox priests who were who were massacred or uh, executed by the Germans. Um, and uh, uh, then here we have a memorial to uh, Ukrainian nationalists who actually were uh, at the beginning of the war of uh, allies of the Germans and who, uh, as we know, also don't have a particularly clean record in the history of the Holocaust. So all of this is kind of adjacent to each other and uh, really no planning has taken place at all. So in 2016, um, a, uh, a, a group of, um, of Ukrainian uh, people, of, uh, of both Russian and Ukrainian businessmen, uh, decided in collaboration uh, with uh, Chief Rabbi Blach, we see to the right, the right, the Chief Rabbi of the Ukraine, and uh, with a, uh, an international board that includes uh, Nathan Sharansky, uh, the fourth uh, of the left and a very prominent uh, politicians uh, from Europe, uh, for example, Joschka Fischer, the former uh, German Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, ex-president Kwasniewski of Poland, uh, and uh, uh, former Senator Lieberman from the United States, and so on, to basically uh, create a framework to um, start to uh, bring the, to in some way to tame the chaos and the free-for-all attitude uh, at Babi Yar. And so here we have the board of the new organization uh, that was created, um, which was financed largely by a number of, of oligarchs. Um, and, uh, uh, and you know, when, when there is money, things can be done. So uh, the first thing that was done was, to, uh, was the absolutely right gesture to create a basic historical narrative, to um, charge historians to come actually with an account uh, of what had happened, with the facts, because there had been a lot of propaganda, had, uh, had, 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 had paraded as history. And so this uh, very uh, substantial and also um, uh, impressive uh, kind of analysis and report on the events of, of, of uh, late September 1941, uh, and also on what happened at the site afterwards, was published in uh, or, uh, around three years ago. So once the facts were established, the question was what to do with it. And two years ago, 
the foundation decided that at the southern edge of the uh, of the site, uh, uh, they would, and we see here a number of these memorials, they're all of the green little circles, uh, a museum would be built, a very large museum. There was no collection for it, but the idea was that this museum would become a Holocaust museum relating specifically to the site, but also to the Holocaust of, uh, of, of the Jews in Eastern Europe, and that in size and importance, it would basically compete with both Yad, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in uh, Washington, D.C. And, and, and as I said, uh, the one issue that uh, the uh, Babi Yar people didn't face was a lack of funds. So a competition was held and uh, a competition brief was created and uh, the first prize went to a architecture firm from Vienna, Austria, called Kreerkraft, which uh, basically um, proposed a museum that was going to be underground. And of course, this is, it's an enormous museum. I'm going to, to show you um, some images here of the approach to the museum uh, through the site, uh, really nice architectural uh, drawings. And uh, here, uh, the, the museum itself as it, as it descends into the ground. But of course, Babi Yar is cursed ground. It is ground where you know, there are many questions about also what is, what is original, what is not. Uh, uh, we do know that the human remains uh, of the victims of the massacre um, in 1941 had been removed by, uh, by subsequent uh, German actions. Uh, but still, there's also the mudslide. It, 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 it was really kind of a very problematical um, a proposal to create such a enormous uh, architectural structure that was going to basically penetrate into the ground. So two years ago, uh, or a year and a half ago, um, Ilya Krasnovsky uh, took over um, uh, basically as artistic leader uh, of the Babi Yar uh, Foundation. And he is a brilliant Russian filmmaker uh, who uh, has very strong ideas of what, what should happen and what should not happen. And um, he decided to uh, cancel the whole museum project. Um, he, uh, he created a lot of controversy because um, he, uh, he, at a certain moment, uh, was accused, and this is a New York Times article, uh, that he uh, wanted to uh, create a kind of Holocaust Disneyland in, um, in, in Babi Yar, which I think is a, uh, a uh, kind of story that, that got its own life and which I thought was really quite unfair to him. Uh, he very much, uh, as a filmmaker, wanted to create conditions in which uh, visitors to the site would, uh, would have some experiences that are out of the ordinary. That would not be uh, the everyday experience you have when you come there as a, uh, as a, uh, as, as a visitor to play soccer or to have a family picnic. Uh, and so um, in, in May 26, 2020, a year and a half ago, this article appeared in, um, in the New York Times, which, um, which uh, you know, in some way suggested that this was going to be the future of Babi Yar. And this was more or less also the time that I got involved. And, and I had to really um, you know, decide if, if I was going to be part of this project given the kind of negative um, publicity that was all around it. Um, I talked with Ilya, I talked with other members and, and became member of a new board that was created by Ilya. Uh, Ilya asked uh, an, an architectural critic from Amsterdam, originally from the United States, Nick Axel, to form an advisory committee on what to do with the site from an architectural point of view, because the museum, uh, the, really the museum project had been kind of without any, uh, any clear kind of committee of people who were able to judge it. And so um, we started work uh, in the beginning of September of last year, so in the middle of COVID. Um, and um, in October, uh, during a meeting um, where I just said, you know, why don't we start small and have a very small synagogue at the site so that, that it's possible uh, that for, for people to pray there. 
uh, that Ilya just overheard me and said, okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to build the synagogue. And so this is the synagogue then that is the result of it. Um, so the concept in some way that is, is guiding both the, 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 this particular synagogue as, the, as well as the whole development of the site was really developed uh, in the 1980s uh, by uh, the American architectural educator, John Hayduck, who taught at, at the Cooper Union School of Architecture. And um, John Hayduck uh, is, proposed, uh, this is basically his proposal for a, a Holocaust memorial at the topography of terror in Berlin, the topography of terror, uh, which is a site of the old uh, uh, Gestapo headquarters. And he proposed to create basically uh, a, a site in which over 20, 30, 40 years, small additions would be made and that these would be kind of playful. Um, and uh, uh, so his sense was that, uh, that, that a memorial uh, should be incremental and that also that it, it, it should have a kind of almost, uh, it, it should be something that would be understandable, he said, especially to children. So it almost looks a little bit like, like a fair. If you look at these uh, various kinds of uh, these, these, these buildings, small buildings that each become a kind of a character and that tells a story. Uh, very different from what ultimately was built. Uh, this is the Topography of Terror uh, Documentation Center of the work of the Gestapo, uh, uh, which was built in, in, in Germany, a gray box on a site that also is completely gray. It is full of gray gravel. And so uh, at the opening, uh, the Architectural Review, uh, which is a major architectural journal, uh, basically commented on what was done as follows. At the opening on 5th of May, the 65th anniversary of the war's end, the architect was unwilling to talk about her concept, saying that the building spoke for itself. When asked why everything was gray, the landscape architect's answer was equally enlightening. What else could it be? So a gray box in a gray landscape is, in this view, how a Holocaust memorial should look like, or a memorial to uh, the persecution. Uh, of, of Jews and other people. So um, it, basically following the proposal that Hayduck uh, had done, but which was not realized, um, basically we started to think uh, about, and we is not only our committee, but also the people of the foundation of a kind of park in which we're talking about a hundred year project in which we are going to make small additions one by one by one, but this time, in a somewhat more planned way and not having just memorials where you can put uh, flowers, but basically to create uh, places uh, in which people can, uh, can engage in a number of, of, of different activities. So here we have um, the site uh, indicated here, and this is, this is one of the proposals and as things change are changing, of you know, place where you listen, a place where you wander, a place where you can stumble over information, a place for remembrance, a place for praying, and so on. And uh, so this, this is then basically how we have started to think about the place. So here we have again the site, 120 uh, hectares that we have, we that is the foundation, the Babi Yar Foundation controls in the center of Kiev. This is then the hidden ravine uh, that basically is in some way below there. It doesn't exist anymore, but this was uh, as it existed in 1941. And so uh, the idea is that at the places where the ravine could be entered, there are going to be a number of special places that allow, uh, that, that have a certain theme and that allow basically that theme to be expressed in uh, different ways. So um, uh, I have here, uh, and, and this is not my program, the sublime is going to be dealing with, with, with ideas of religion, wisdom, roots and family. This is very close to a place where right now uh, also a lot of picnics take place. Um, inclusiveness, uh, normality, that is actually at the place of the, uh, where the terrain of the, um, of the uh, asylum begins and so of course these are people who are not included in society and so on there 
And um, this then uh, is going, all these places are going to be connected to a kind of path that is going to, um, that is going to connect uh, these places and that traces the bottom of the ravine as it existed in 1941. And so uh, in some way, uh, it will be possible then through these different places and the paths between them to start to actually understand the topography of the old ravine. So uh, the place where, uh, where we started the work was actually the place where the Orthodox Church was already built. This is going to be a place where uh, all religious art activities are going to be concentrated. And so uh, the first project was our unfolding synagogue since the new uh, foundation was formed. So here we have a kind of uh, conceptual construction drawing of the framework of the synagogue uh, as it's fully unfolded. And here uh, a photo which I've already shown you. Now, in order to, um, in order to, um, uh, to in some way help the uh, foundation and especially the architectural board to understand what the issues were at stake, I um, gave a number of seminars on, on Jewish space and to how to conceptualize Jewish space. And this became like a mini course, which we conducted in, in October 2020, in the middle of COVID, all by Zoom. And the result of that basically is this Atlas of Jewish Space uh, that, uh, that uh, then uh, ultimately uh, Mark Potwell joined me in to basically provide illustrations for both out of his work that he has done over the past 30 years, 40 years, uh, he's been an illustrator for the New York Times, but also a practicing doctor, a dermatologist. But here, for example, uh, we have um, the spice boxes for the Haftalah. And uh, this image is, uh, is, is uh, for me, important. I write a short essay then about the importance of time, that in fact the Jewish, uh, the Jewish tradition is actually not that interested in space, much more about time. And of course, the end of Shabbat is a very uh, important and solemn uh, uh, moment in the week uh, when we move from holy time back into secular time. Or uh, uh, then the, uh, the importance of the ghetto, that is a, a drawing of the Prague ghetto. You see all of the church spires at the back, uh, but basically how the ghetto created what, uh, what some people have called the claustrophilia. A, a, a love uh, by Jews for small and tight spaces. Uh, it's a con controversial kind of concept, but uh, in this case, um, I'm using this, this, this concept of, of Mark Potwell to illustrate that. Here, uh, an, an illustration by Mark Potwell for a talk about the relationship of the six days of the week when in the, uh, in, in the uh, language of, of Heinrich Heine, a famous 19th century Jewish poet in, in Germany, uh, the Jews live like dogs. And then on Shabbat, when the Jews live like princes or princesses. And so here, six uh, coats with the Jew star on it, uh, marking the Jew as a uh, inferior human being. But then on the Shabbat, the star is removed for one day. Or well, here, uh, again, the idea of time, the waiting for the tense man in the synagogue, the way that, uh, that in some way in the Jewish tradition, by all kinds of different ideas, also waiting for the beginning of Shabbat, when the first stars are going to be out, and you know, always checking exactly what time is the beginning of Shabbat this week. It's, not, it's not, never the same. But then the same happens in the synagogue, the waiting for the tense man. So the dimension of time that in some way supersedes that of space, or as we have it during the Seder evening, when in some way one uh, eats uh, the matzah and one basically participates in the meal as if one were in uh, Egypt and were, uh, were, were liberated oneself um, as our ancestors were uh, uh, in the time of Moses. Um, then uh, very important again in this whole tradition is the, the idea of, of ancestors, the continuity of ancestors uh, of, of basically one's family tree. And we see here Mark Potwell interpretation of the family tree, the tombstones who are now hanging into this uh, genealogical tree. 
And uh, again, this, this idea that in the Jewish tradition, um, the, 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 the redemption itself is actually uh, expressed in lineage in the relationship of grandparents to grandchildren. That is the promise that God gave to Abraham. Uh, and then dealing with concepts like, uh, in this case, this is, this is a drawing by Mark Potwell of the hometown of his mother, Dambrova, uh, but then he in some way creates this idea of this community that is surrounded by the Tefillin, but, but in this case also it's an interpretation of the Eruf, that, uh, the, the, the boundary that is created on Shabbat that allows Jews to wear uh, to basically carry things within that boundary, despite the fact that it's Shabbat. Or here, um, an, a consideration of the shtetl, the shtetl, and uh, the way the shtetl organized itself spatially, uh, which, uh, as uh, Sholem Aleichem uh, beautifully describes in his, in his stories of Kazulevka and later Anatevka in Fiddler on the Roof, uh, as places uh, that have a very unique and unusual kind of arrangement uh, of, of the houses in relationship to the synagogue and to the cemetery. Um, and so this was all part of an attempt to basically attune uh, the foundation to the unique dimensions of true space. Here, the page of, a, uh, of, 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 of the Talmud, which you see the centrifugal the centrifugal force that basically uh, focuses on the periphery, not on the center. It's, it is about the continuous debates that exist or the Talmud as an, as an ocean in which one can find almost anything one wants if, uh, if, if you just look for it because there's an ongoing debate. It is not a place that tries to articulate uh, some creed. Um, uh, or this whole problem in, in today, in the, in the, the, you know, that in some way the unresolved borders of the state of Israel, in fact, is part of that very old kind of um, uh, uh, uneasiness uh, that uh, Jews have also with boundaries, with fixed boundaries, which very clearly has a Talmudic kind of, uh, of origin. Or then uh, going into the space uh, that is created by Kabbalistic traditions, the space of uh, the, uh, the, the Adam Katmon, or to Tzimtzum, the space of contraction, which is God's exile that becomes the world. Or the space that also is very important in, in Jewish tradition, the space of opposition to Judaism, that of the dialectic, of the debates between Christians and Jews, quite often quite hostile debates here, the church to the left, the Torah to the right, uh, or even the way that our persecutors also in some way define our identity or part of our identity also help to shape our space, which ultimately leads them to Auschwitz uh, and where uh, the gas chambers in which 3 million of the 6 million victims of the Holocaust died in Auschwitz, Treblinka, and some of the other death camps are spaces that really are beyond human space that are invisible, that cannot be described, that are spaces that have no witnesses. And how we are living with the fragments today, fragments of, in this case, uh, Jewish tombstones, but then in this drawing by Mark Potwell, you see clearly that in some way, they are in some way also carrying the imprint here of those who destroyed uh, these tombstones. So, and here then the tombstones, uh, which uh, he drew for uh, an introduction to the chapter in which in the book, I uh, basically introduced the project to recreate one of these wooden synagogues. Here we see them all in flames uh, during the Second World War, but also uh, during the pogroms before, and then leading to an attempt to rebuild uh, this type of which not a single wooden synagogue existed anymore, it only existed in stories, but to uh, resurrect one uh, at Babi Yar. So this was basically an educational project and the book is a, is a result of that. It's kind of a, you know, uh, one, uh, it is a 101 of, uh, of, of, of true space. Um, I just want to now end with showing where we are right now in the development. So the yellow circle again shows uh, the place where the synagogue is constructed. 
Uh, the next project is actually going to be the administration building of the former Jewish cemetery. This is the place where actually the um, the victims were uh, were ordered to uh, to come on the 29th of um, of uh, September 1941 to the right. We see the gate to the Jewish cemetery uh, in the back. Uh, we're looking towards the road away from the synagogue. Uh, the synagogue is around a 10, 15 minute walk from here, but you see the old administration building of the of the um, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the cemetery, and here we see a conceptual drawing. It's not going to be like this. How basically we're going to raise the roof, which is not historical, and we are creating an observation deck uh, uh, up there, which allows people to get an introduction to the site as a whole. Uh, and then uh, uh, another project that is almost completed. It is a kurgan. A kurgan is a uh, kind of a mount uh, in the tradition of the Ukrainian burial mounds, uh, that, 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 that literal landscape there. And this actually uh, will uh, cover uh, an enormous scale model of the original site. So you can go under that roof and you can actually see the ravine as it existed in 1941. And it will be possible then, because it doesn't exist anymore, to get the sense of the exact location of the uh, of, of, of the massacre. So uh, this is uh, this is the three places that have the yellow dots are where we're working right now. Uh, and we are developing um, basically a concept for the central axis. Uh, and my friend Anna Kamishan, who until recently was the architectural um, uh, coordinator, um, basically had a version of Columbus's uh, saying, in order to reach the east, let's go west. Uh, she said, in order to touch what's below, let's go up. And so uh, inspired by uh, projects like the High Line in New York and so on, and these kinds of walkways through forests, the idea is actually to elevate, and we, this is in England, an old Roman construction, is to actually elevate um, the paths through, uh, through the whole site, to lift it above the existing terrain, so that this idea of the downwards gaze, which is represented in this historical photo, uh, for, you, for, for people to actually understand the site, and one will be somewhat separated from it, but one will look down at the site and be introduced to the history of it. So this ends my introduction to Babiyar. This is then, uh, you know, as, it, uh, as, as the site will, uh, I hope, exist 100 years from now or 50 years from now. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you Robert, very much. Robert, that was absolutely fascinating, including the analysis of the thinking that is going into it. Um, I'll encourage people to put questions in the chat. Can I ask you to comment? Um, you know, the authorities, the Russians, the Ukrainians did not want to admit to Babi Yar existing for many years. And how was their mind changed? How did that change? And where do you see that position nowadays? Now, the, so the, for the Soviet Union, for the Soviet Union, um, the whole Holocaust was a problem. I mean, they... They, they never really, uh, they, they always talked about the, the Second World War. This was the great patriotic war. There were millions of, of Soviet citizens who died or citizens of other countries, but they were never willing to basically recognize that the murder of the Jews, of 6 million Jews, or for that matter, the genocide of between 500,000 and 1.5 million uh, Roman city, were had a special dimension, that they were genocides, that they were not part you know, let's call it ordinary war victims. Uh, in some way, they, they scooped all of the civilian, civ civilian victims up into the anti-Bolshevik uh, uh, kind of uh, war of the Germans, the Hitlerites, as they were called, against the, the Soviet people. In 1991, this changed because, uh, first of all, we have now the Soviet Union, the communist state collapses. We get now a number of national states that come out of it, Russian Federation, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Lithuania, and so on. And now uh, it becomes possible for the first time to basically start to, um, to, 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 to uh, certainly in the Ukraine and also in, in uh, I think most in Ukraine, 
to look more honestly at what actually happened, that the war against the Jews, as Lucy Davido, Davido, Davidovich called it, was very different in its scale and its intention uh, than the war uh, of the Germans against uh, the Ukrainians in general, against the Russians and so on. And um, the Ukraine certainly, uh, I would say, uh, compared to the other post-Soviet states has probably gone farthest in, in correcting this fundamentally misguided way of looking at the history uh, of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe. And, uh, you know, right now it has a president uh, who is Zelensky, who is, who is, you know, a Jewish man. He is basically, his, his family was, was uh, survived uh, the Holocaust in Ukraine. Um, uh, and uh, also uh, there is a real, uh, I think, desire in significant parts of the Ukrainian civil society to get this right. Doesn't mean it's without problems, doesn't mean it's without struggles. Um, there are also parts in the Ukrainian nationalist movement that, that basically uh, has a sense of discomfort with it. But right now there is clearly the political will in the, in the society at large and also the political leadership to basically, um, uh, basically and, and in some way it's also a ticket to the West. It's a ticket to be accepted in Europe. Ukraine wants to become member of the European Union. Uh, when the European Union saw itself uh, confronted in uh, after 2000 with the applications of Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, other East European countries uh, to become member of this very exclusive uh, club, uh, they basically made uh, the European Union made uh, the condition that these countries would in some way come to terms with its history during the Holocaust. And one of the aspects of that is that a precondition for admission into the EU that the country accepts January 27th, that is uh, the day of the European uh, Holocaust Memorial Day as a national holiday of commemoration. And so uh, Ukraine is trying to come, become part of the EU, it's trying to become part of NATO. It needs to start to show that it's capable of are basically dealing with its past in a, let's call it a civilized manner. And so the Holocaust has become an important part of that political agenda. Uh, and that is why the Ukrainian civil society in generally is willing to go much farther than uh, I think it would be the case uh, if the integration within the European Union was not on the agenda. And thank you. Um, can you talk about the financial support for this? You've got a question. How is this going to be continued and is this to keep it a reality? Uh, the financial support right now is largely private. I mean, there is, uh, I don't really know the details of the fundraising. Um, you, you, there are other committees for that. Uh, <laughs> it was, of course, absolutely amazing that, you know, we had an idea and that we had to, suddenly we had a budget for it and that there was no yes. complaint about the money. We were able to harvest old lumber from everywhere in Ukraine, we were able to create this thing uh, in no time. Enormous amount of, uh, of, of human resources and physical resources were mobilized to make this possible. I mean, we only started construction in January and the synagogue was finished in April. I mean, this was absolutely amazing and it's absolutely, it's gorgeous, it's beautiful. It's, this is not sloppy work. Um, it's very clear that private individuals are key to the financing. Uh, these are, you know, the we can call them the 0.1% to the 0.001%. Um, of course, that is controversial. Uh, there is no money, uh, you can say, essentially within uh, Ukrainian civil society to do that. Uh, I don't think that fundraising for Babi Yar in North America or elsewhere in Europe would raise much money. Also, given the fact that you know the history is is a little is somewhat controversial, and because Holocaust uh, synagogues and Holocaust organizations and museums in North America are certainly uh, don't want uh, Ukraine to come into their you know and and, and basically uh, basically uh, uh, involve themselves with raising funds uh, that they could use themselves very well. So uh, I must say that uh, I'm very grateful uh, that these men have stepped up to the plate. Right now, they, uh, they come with really very few conditions. Um, uh, I was really quite uh, surprised how 
uh, how much of the or that basically our proposals were uh, immediately approved, uh, which we did as basically people who are not attached to any uh, kind of political agenda or anything with a religious agenda, but simply coming forward from a real kind of uh, uh, intense architectural debate that our proposals were accepted and that we found immediate financing for them. Now, I don't think that that's necessarily going to continue always like that. In the future, one of the problems when you're dependent on a few uh, very wealthy donors is that they can change their mind. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've also learned that. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, these... Uh, Can you just... These, uh, uh, yeah, you've got a couple of other questions before we end. Um, what happened to the people that were murdered, um, to the bodies at Babiar? And where are all the people from Kiev? Okay, so the bodies, first of all, the bodies that, that were buried at the site, uh, and you saw the Soviet POWs, you saw them basically putting sand over the site. So basically the ravine becomes an execution site, becomes an open grave, and then basically sand is, uh, or dirt is put on top of it. In 1943, uh, a, a German unit arrived called um, uh, uh, Sonderkommando 1005, and this uh, was created in order to erase traces of massacres of Jews. And so basically, uh, with the help of Jewish slave workers, all of the graves were uh, opened again, and the, uh, the remains were burnt at open pyres. And so then, and then the, 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 bone, uh, the, the, the remains of the bones and so on were crushed and they were flushed down the river. So basically by 1944, the end of 1943, when the Red Army arrived, there were very few human remains either in Babi Yar or in any of the other mass graves that existed all over the Ukraine. And so the second part of the question was- Whether the, the people the were all from Kiev, whether uh, people were rounded up just from the city of Kiev. Yeah, these, these are not uh, at the scale that Jews were, were rounded up. I mean, these tend to be much smaller targeted executions. You know, in the case of, of Babi Yar, the Babi Yar massacre, we talk about 34,000 men, uh, mostly old men, women, and children who were there murdered uh, in a 24-hour period. When we talk about uh, the murder of, of Ukrainian nationalists or priests or so on, we talk uh, each time about dozens of people, but not about this enormous... Uh, enormous uh, scale of the operation that 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 characterized the, the murder of the Jews. Do you know, uh, are you familiar with the exhibition, The Evidence Room? Marlene's got an interesting question. Um, is there any thought given to bringing an exhibition um, to illustrate what's happening at Babi Yar, you know, to museums around the world? Uh, now, the evidence room I created, so I'm quite... Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I, had I'm very, really, I'm very, I had not realized that. Well, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah no, I, 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 uh, so that was in, at the ROM, it was at, in yes. Venice. Yeah, so uh, there are ideas. So so right now, uh, the idea about... Uh, basically, uh, there's, there's talk about two museums. One museum that is a museum about the Holocaust in, in Eastern Europe, um, that is still in some way going to be in a kind of triangular relationship with Yad Vashem and the United States Holocaust Memorials Museum that is in scale already. A lot of work is being done by the foundation. They already have basic curatorial staff at work. They are trying to name every victim who died in Babi Yar and in the Holocaust in, the, uh, in, in, um, in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, uh, books are being published and so on. So there's a lot of work being done. They don't have much of a collection yet. And the second museum that they're thinking of is actually a large museum on the history of Jews in Eastern Europe. Of course, Ukraine was the heartland of, uh, of, of uh, the Ukraine that is then really the old Polish Commonwealth, but Ukraine was part of the Polish Commonwealth, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. It's the old heartland of Jews' life, not only in Eastern Europe, but really in the world. And, uh, and so there is an idea that the site will also contain a museum that will uh, show the life of Jews and not the death, death of Jews. Uh, as far as the foundation going to send exhibitions into the world, right now, I think that they're pretty stretched with uh, what they are doing. Uh, certainly, um, I think that, uh, that uh, for the time being, I don't see uh, kind of ready-made exhibitions uh, to, to leave Kiev 
to arrive in Toronto or other places. Right. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating. I think we could carry on talking for ages. I'm going to say thank you so much because we're sort of out of time um, to you, Robert, for an outstanding presentation, really. Um, I hope people will buy the book um, when it comes out at the end of January and uh, really hope that maybe you will join us again. I also want to thank Gail Kurzman, who runs all the special events at Beth Tikva for doing an amazing job in putting this program together. And I hope everyone will continue to join Classy Lectures as we bring history to life for uh, our audience. And um, thank you again very, very much.